All right, this next video is going to focus primarily on art of the Mughal Empire, as you can see from the image on the screen. And then we will move on to thinking about Western conceptions of Asian art and also Western misconceptions of Asian art and how we can see that in popular culture. Then we'll think about the Khmer Empire in Cambodia, looking at the example of Angkor Wat. Um, so moving back in time a little bit from the Mughal Empire. Then we will move into Thailand and look at an example of the walking Buddha, the Sukhothai walking Buddha, and also the example of the Emerald Buddha in Bangkok today, which is still a really important uh, object, an important icon in Bangkok that's still deeply linked to the king of Thailand. So we'll end there. So starting off with the Mughal Empire, uh, it was a massive and very powerful empire going uh, through the 16th, 17th, and into the 18th century, ending in the 19th century. You can see from this map that it controlled most of central and northern India, also areas of Pakistan and modern-day Afghanistan. This was an empire that's largely seen as an, an empire that was really foreign to India, so they were coming from the area of Central Asia. They brought a lot of Persian influences with them, but their empire definitely combined with Indian tradition, so it really is this kind of interesting combination of Persian and Indian influences, as well as some European influences as well. It was a very wealthy empire and again very powerful because of the land holdings that they eventually grew to control. Uh, we will be looking at a couple of different rulers and the types of type of artwork that they were commissioning. So starting off with this term of iconoclasm, iconoclast, um, these were Muslim rulers, so they were um, following the faith of Islam, and so this tends to avoid representations of living beings, so humans, animals, things that were created, but the idea that creation really is the role of God, the creation of living things is something that God does, not something that artists need to do. So that's a key difference between what we saw in Hinduism, where we see a lot of representation of gods or deities, where we see a lot of representation of the human form. Um, we're not really going to see that in the Mughal period. So this idea of iconoclasm and iconoclast, some, so an iconoclasm would be, um, it can be the destruction of images or it can be meaning you're against images and then an individual who's against images is an iconoclast. Um, so we don't really see a lot of religious use of images in terms of the human form, but we still see floral design, geometric design, calligraphy associated with the Quran and other religious inscriptions. Important rulers of the Mughal dynasty that we're going to see, um, Akbar, so Akbar meaning great, Jahangir, a ruler whose name meant or whose title meant world Caesar, um, so like grabber of the world not Caesar, like Roman Caesar. Uh, Shah Jahan, who was the patron of the Taj Mahal, who we'll focus on in just a few minutes, uh, and his wife, one of his wives, Mumtaz Mahal, who he is buried with at the Taj Mahal. So Shah Jahan, uh, meaning ruler of the world. So three very powerful rulers from the Mughal dynasty, although we are gonna see representations of the human form in some types of paintings from these rulers. Just some quick background on Islam, because obviously we've been going through different religions in Asia, and we've looked at things like Shinto, Buddhism, We've looked at Hinduism as well, and so now we're moving on to Islam. Islam was founded by Muhammad, the prophet, in the 7th century in Arabia. The most sacred cities today are in Saudi Arabia, so cities like Mecca and Medina. Um, Islam believes in complete submission to Allah, and this is the same single deity, the same deity of Jewish and Christian faiths. The Jewish and Christian faiths. Sorry, let's delete the end there. There we go. That's better. Uh, Islam sacred scriptures, the Quran, meaning recitation, were revealed to Muhammad over more than 20 years. So this was a process where these words of God were revealed to him. Uh, and sometimes these were seen as very kind of painful moments for him. This idea that he was a prophet, obviously, as someone who's receiving a, a, a message from God. And so Muhammad is the final prophet and the most significant prophet in Islam. Images of Allah are forbidden, so again, this, this idea of being really cautious about the, the images that you're using, um, but the Prophet Muhammad is sometimes shown in art, although it can be controversial. 
So the five pillars of faith for Islam is the creed, the idea that um, Allah is God and Muhammad is his prophet, prayer five times daily towards Mecca, fasting at certain periods of the year, including Ramadan, uh, almsgiving, that is giving to charity, and then pilgrimage. So um, at a specific time, doing this pilgrimage to Mecca, to the most holy city. A Muslim is a person who has made a submission to God. So the Muslim is the individual and Islam is the faith. So thinking about this dynasty, the Mughal dynasty, where the rulers were Muslim, um, we do see a lot of representations of some human forms in certain cases. So there are these types of paintings, including historical paintings, historical events, which we see here. These would recount accomplishments of the rulers. There were also copies and modifications of European prints that were being, um, through trade, being sent into the Mughal Empire, uh, the lands of the Mughal Empire, and then also portraits of the emperors. So we actually, in the more secular works of art, we do see images of the human form permissible. However, in religious structures, you really see these forms avoided. Let's focus in on one of these types of historical uh, texts. This is called the Akbar Nama. So if you remember, one of the ruler's name was Akbar, so the great. Um, and so Akbar, this is a particular scene where he's subduing a mad elephant. So you see these two elephants charging across a bridge of boats. You can see the boats supporting the bridge. You see everyone kind of running away, this chaotic moment. Um, everyone very fearful. But the idea here is that Akbar remains calm throughout this event. So so he's showing his ability as a ruler. Um, it's also interesting because he, there was this long tradition in art of also showing the Buddha over overtaking these kinds of chaotic scenes or overcoming these kinds of chaotic scenes. So there's actually this interesting medallion where we see the Buddha, who's shown here, um, basically taming a mad elephant. So I think this is a really interesting co combination um, because the Mughal rulers were so smart in terms of thinking about what are some of the images that uh, individuals in India are already familiar with, and they were thinking about images associated with Buddhism and then, of course, Hinduism as well. And so here we're seeing an example where they're telling a story of Akbar being calm in the face of this mad elephant, but ultimately this type of story goes all the way back to iconography from Buddhism. Other images of Akbar include um, the young Akbar as taking his throne. You can see him on this multi-sided throne that's essentially a platform with individuals coming to pay their respects to him. You can also see Akbar calmly killing a tiger, always very calm and controlled. Um, also the idea of what did the ruler accomplish, what kind of patronage, and so there was an important fort in the city of Agra, and this is the building of that particular fort, and this fort will become important for Shah Jahan, who we'll see in just a minute with the Taj Mahal, so please do not forget about it. A very famous image of a um, the ruler that will come next, Jahangir, known as the World Caesar, um, is called the allegorical representation of the emperor Jahangir seated on an hourglass throne. And the idea here is that he's produ he's preferring an an Islamic Sufi, so a Sufi, an Islamic mystic, an ascetic, right here, um, to two kings or two rulers who have come to see him. And so we have the Ottoman Sultan and then we have the King of England. And so you can see this Sufi, this ascetic and mystic, the, is the one who's most prominent, who seems very high up, almost as tall as Jahangir, of course not quite as tall. Um, and Jahangir is presenting him with a gift, a book. You can see that the Sufi is placing a cloth on his hand so that his hands do not directly touch. The ruler's hands do not directly touch um, Jahangir's hands. You can see that Jahangir is on another one of these elevated thrones, although the throne itself is an hourglass. And this could refer to the idea that although they want Jahangir to rule forever, he's running out of time, or the idea that hopefully he'll be granted a rule of eternity, that he will be he will rule forever. And we see this with so many kings that they want to be granted immortality. So one of the inscriptions on here include things like Shah Jahan, son of Akbar, the emperor. He is emperor through the grace of God. Although to all appearances, kings stand before him, like again, the Ottoman Sultan, um, the King of England. 
uh, he looks inwardly toward the dervishes for guidance. So this idea that he's looking towards more modest figures and that he would prefer a visit from a religious individual to a politically powerful individual. Um, at the top, at the very bottom, excuse me, you see Bichetir, who is the painter of this miniature. And so I just wanted to point him out and you can see that he's holding an image identifying his trade. In the Mughal period, there were... Um, workshops for people to be trained in miniature painting and also in calligraphy. So these were important skills that artists could learn and there were formalized workshops to learn ab about the techniques for this. Let's carry on. Um, zooming in, you can see that Jahangir is very much framed by a beautiful halo. The halo is composed of a sun and a moon, and a crescent moon. You can see that this would indicate his power over the whole universe and also over all of time, both day and night. And then there's this little European style cherub or sometimes called a puto or multiple would be a putti. So you can see these figures up here. Um, and the the cherub is covering his eyes, and that's probably because it's Jahangir is so glorious, and and the sun and moon are glowing. Um, but some people have also suggested that it could be a crying cherub, and often we do see crying cherubs in Christian imagery because they're crying if Christ uh, is being crucified or they're mourning over his dead body. So it's possible that these artists saw these cherubs from a Christian image and then copied them into uh, these Mughal paintings. And so, anyways, it could have originally supposed, to, you know, intended to be a crying cherub, but in fact, in this image, it's supposed to be an overwhelmed cherub uh, covering his eyes. Um, another possibility is that the cherub could be crying because of this idea of the hourglass, the idea that Jahangir is running out of time if that's the interpretation that the artist intended here. Zooming in on those two kings, you can see the Ottoman Sultan again, you can see his elaborate garment. Both uh, King James I of England and the Ottoman Sultan are wearing very elaborate dress in comparison to the Sufi. And then uh, you can see that these angels are inscribing on Jahangir's throne, O Shah of Shah, meaning O King of Kings, may your reign last 10,000 years. So that lends itself more to this reading of they're hoping that he will rule forever, that the hourglass will essentially never run out of sand. Uh, okay, and that's Bichetir again, the painter. Let's move on to the Taj Mahal, probably one of our most important in a artworks for today, although Angkor Wat is incredibly important too. Um, the Taj Mahal means crown palace. It was built in a pretty quick, you know, pretty quickly um, from 1632 to 47. The mausoleum was built in honor of Mumtaz Mahal originally, meaning chosen one of the palace. She died in 1631 after giving birth to her 14th child at the age of 38. Although some historical records say she was 37, she was in her late 30s approximately. Um, obviously she had given birth to many, many children. She was widely known as Shah Jahan's favorite wife. He had multiple wives, which was quite common at this time, both for making political alliances and ensuring the continuity of um, you know having enough heirs having uh, a son that could carry on the throne and so once she died it was said that he his beard turned white there's many stories about his intense devotion to his wife although there are other stories essentially saying he was quite a womanizer so there is some controversy on this whether this is entirely a monument to love eventually Shah Jahan is also buried in this Islamic mausoleum and so it's Probably, it probably wasn't intended just for Mumtaz Mahal, although I think we can pretty firmly say that he liked her the best because she is the one buried next to him. And so this is the structure, of course. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Here we see that crown palace or Taj Mahal. Uh, and so you can see that it's the tomb of Mumtaz Mahal and Shah Jahan. It was an incredibly um, expensive building enterprise. It used primarily white marble, which was incredibly expensive. It also involved uh, creating a beautiful garden, which you can see in the foreground here. In addition to using white marble, other precious and semi-precious stones were used and inlaid into the structure. It has a lot of pietra dura or cut stone that's incorporated into it. There's also calligraphy added to it. It has a wonderful sense of symmetry and clarity, this idea of entering into paradise in the afterlife. You can see the large domes, smaller domes along the side, uh, ornamental minarets. So traditionally on a 
real mosque, so this isn't a mosque, it's a mausoleum, although there is a mosque to the side. Um, traditionally on a mosque you would have minarets, and these are places, towers, that are used to call people to prayer, to alert people um, to prayer, that it's time to pray. And these are ornamental, however, and just provide for uh, the look of a traditional Islamic structure, and also the idea of symmetry for the structure as a whole. Here's a representation of Shah Jahan with his four sons. You can get that sense of kind of world domination again. Also the idea that he has plenty of heirs, so nobody needs to worry about that. If we go back to Jahangir, when Jahangir was 28, he still didn't have a son. And so there was actually this Sufi who came to him and told him he would have a son. And that was another reason why this particular Sufi was so favored. Um, Jah excuse me, Shah Jahan did not have that problem. He had plenty of sons and plenty of kids, although later in life he will become very ill and uh, one of his sons essentially refuses to allow him to come back into power once he is better. He, has, he puts his father under house arrest for the last few years of his life. Um, so that's kind of a sad twist to this story where he was so confident in all the sons that he had. The location of these sites is Agra, so you're seeing it right here in northern India. The Taj Mahal is quite famous as a symbol of love. That's how many people interpret it today. Um, it also is a heavily photographed monument. You can see all these different colors that it takes on when the light changes around it. Many people talk about how the effect you get from this white marble. Here's an overall view of the complex as a whole. If you ever visit the Taj Mahal, the ticket entrance is right here. This is the gateway, the original gateway entrance. You have um, a four-part garden and four rivers, essentially, and it was said that there were four rivers in paradise. This wonderful symmetry to the overall structure. You have a mosque and a guest house framing the mausoleum itself, and then the river behind it. There are many interpretations to the Taj Mahal, but one of the most recent uh, relates to an inscription on the gateway, the entranceway to the to the complex as a whole that says, O thou soul at peace, return thou unto thy Lord, well pleased and well pleasing unto him. Enter thou among my servants and enter thou my paradise. So this inscription from the Surah 89, so a Surah is a chapter in the Quran, and so this reinforces the idea of paradise. And then there's been this idea that um, the structure, the mausoleum itself, is reminiscent of a throne. And so there's this idea that it's an allegorical representation of the throne of God located above paradise where the last judgment will take place. So a very symbolic reading, um, but some of the inscriptions reinforce this as we can see here, and also the format of the, of the structure is somewhat similar to kind of elevated platform thrones that we see in the Mughal Empire. Let's get closer to the structure itself. You can see the white marble, you can see the inscriptions. Uh, Shah Jahan ensured that he had expert calligraphers working on this project. You can see the floral design, so there's no human forms on this one, very different from the types of uh, miniatures that we've been seeing, the paintings we've been seeing. Um, you can see, so these of course are more secular and then this is a more sacred structure. And much of this design links back to Persian painting. So there is a cenotaph in the main floor that goes directly below the dome. There are two of them, and these are essentially the symbolic burial spaces for the kind of false burial sites for the uh, for Mumtaz Mahal and Shah Jahan. Mumtaz's site is slightly smaller, but it's directly below the dome, whereas Shah Jahan is slightly off to the side. There's a beautiful screen that surrounds the cenotaphs that include Pietra Dura, which means an Italian hard stone, but essentially it's this kind of cut stone um, that's often used in tabletops and other types of decorative arts, but you can see it here inlaid in the screen. Um, the stones include jasper, onyx, carnelian, lapis lazuli, mother of and mother of pearl in the marble. There are also stories um, during the colonial period of people coming and actually carving out some of the precious stones from this structure. So that's an unfortunate thing that has happened. So I was talking about the kind of more ornamental burial sites, which is the cenotaph. So you can see again, Mumtaz Mahal's is slightly smaller than her husband Shah Jahan over here. And then if you go down into the basement, you have the actual sarcophagi. And so you can see again, Mumtaz's is quite a bit smaller and Shah Jahan's just off to the side. So the unusual thing is that she is actually at center. She's directly below the dome and he seems to be kind of 
a bit of an afterthought off to the side, um, but his prominence is emphasized through the larger presence of his both his cenotaph and the sarcophagus itself. So his is a little bit larger to indicate his greater political status. And he was eventually buried even though his son uh, had put him under house arrest. Uh, there's always been this rumor of was there going to be another Taj that was built, another structure that was built on the other side. Uh, that's probably a rumor that has developed over time. Um, but there was this kind of moonlit garden where one could view the Taj and also see this reflection in the river. And so I'm just showing you a couple of views of that. Here's the reflection in the river and here's the garden on the other side of the river um, where you can see space to view the Taj Mahal on the other side. And this is the fort where Shah Jahan was placed under house arrest. So the kind of part of the story that reinforced that he was so in love with his wife was that he had a view of the Taj. So he could see the Taj Mahal from his window and kind of gaze at the resting place of his great love, but also the idea that um, he could see his great accomplishment. He could see the wonderful building project that he was able to do, but obviously it must have been devastating for him to spend these last years of his life imprisoned when he had experienced so much power and to essentially be imprisoned by one's son. Um, but there are many stories from the Mughal period of just trying to get rid of individuals who might question one's power. And so obviously once the son had claimed power, he didn't want the father to come in and take that away. So the Taj Mahal has become the most famous structure in India. Some people find this strange because it's not really a traditional Indian structure. Many people believe that this is because when the British colonizers came in, they were really struck by it. They did not particularly like the type of decoration that they saw on Hindu temples. They didn't understand the figures with multiple arms. They didn't like the erotic scenes due to things like the Victorian, the pervading Victorian morality of the time. And so these types of structures like the Kandariya Mahadeva that we've seen previously with its erotic scenes, these were very disconcerting to uh, Europeans who were coming into India. But the Taj Mahal was just their style. It was this pure, white, shiny building, very clean and clear, symmetrical. Um, and so this was the, it had flowers all over it. So it was just this kind of structure they felt like they understood a little bit more. And unfortunately, they didn't take the time to understand the kind of symbolism and meaning uh, that one might encounter with the art of Hinduism. So these are some of the quotes of visitors or colonizers who were going to India in the 19th century. So William Emerson says, of all the places I have been to, either in the West or the East, I unhesitatingly affirm that Agra and the Taj Mahal stand preeminent in the impression made on my mind. And then the wife of a British official, Mrs. Sleeman, in 1839 says, I cannot tell you what I think, for I know not how to criticize such a building, but I can tell you what I feel. I would die tomorrow to have such another over me. So this idea that she's willing to die if someone were to build a Taj Mahal for her. Uh, when it was first kind of rediscovered, it was very much overgrown. Obviously, it's very much a tourist attraction now, so it's been cleared away. Um, and modern day ads for India very much emphasize it, tourism ad. So this is the kind of structure they want people to come and see and they think it's going to get you to travel there. So now I want to think a little bit about kind of our Western impressions of India and how it's changed over time. Going back to the 1980s, so 1984 there was a movie called Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom that came out that really misinterpreted a lot about Indian culture um, and it was very offensive to Hindus and to Indians in general. And so as we look back on it, I think we see a lot of problems, but at the time we kind of think about how um, it was considered okay to do this. And so I encourage you to kind of think about or, or watch some of the clips from this film and see how some of diff different stereotypes were used about um, not only Indian culture, but Asian cultures in general. So in this film, you have this idea of there's a lost, what looks like a Shiva Linga, and then uh, of course Indiana Jones has to go out and get it, so he's kind of the great hero in this scene, this idea that the people of the village can't do it themselves. Eventually they end up in this kind of mysterious palace and have a weird banquet that involves the eating of monkey brains and eyeballs, which is very strange for a... Uh, populate, Indian population that a large percentage of people are vegetarian or tend to avoid uh, meat. So there's just that lovely scene with the monkey brains. 
And then there's this weird interpretation of Kali and kind of rituals to Kali that are supposed to be um, reliant on thuggy cult rituals. And there were some ritual killings that would sometimes happen with this particular cult. But uh, in this film, they essentially reinterpret it as an Aztec style heart sacrifice where a heart is removed from someone's chest. So it's, it is very offensive in the sense that this is a goddess, Kali, that continues to be worshipped and that we saw previously in a, in a previous lecture as a protector mother goddess. And so just thinking about how uh, the producer, the director, didn't think this kind of thing would really affect them, didn't think that they would get in trouble for this, um, but now as we look back on it, it's highly, highly problematic. Uh, we continue to see this with things like in 2008, Heidi Klum dressed up as Kali, so we see her here, um, and this was very offensive to some Hindus. So that's just something to consider. I think times have changed quite a bit. Um, but what we have to face now is kind of this onslaught of people wanting to visit sites, visit these kind of sites, especially for social media reasons. So many people want to go to the Taj Mahal or want to go to a place like Angkor Wat, which we're going to look at next. Angkor Wat is in Cambodia. Um, and what kind of effect is that having on the sites? Do these people really understand what they're looking at in these particular cases? It's important to learn about the sites and also to respect the sites. In Cambodia especially, we've had a lot of issues with looting, and so going back to political issues in the 1930s, you have sites that um, were largely, largely abandoned, and then uh, a lot of the sculptures were cut off at the ankles and then um, taken away from the country, and so there's been an effort now to try to return them. But thinking specifically now about Cambodia and about Angkor Wat, which is a major tourist attraction, and does bring a lot of crowds and does bring a lot of people looking for that great social media photo. Um, but let's think about what this structure actually means. So Angkor Wat just means city temple. It was, uh, we don't know its original name. It was constructed under King Suryavarman, which means protector of the sun. The site was dedicated to uh, Vishnu, so the Hindu god Vishnu. Vishnu is preserver and protector, and Suryavarman means protector of the sun. So you have this connection between ruler and god. Uh, it has five major points, so five peaks, which is reminiscent of Mount Meru, which is this um, mountain that is connected to not only Hinduism, but also Buddhism and Jain, Jainism. Um, that's this idea of the center of the universe and the, a really important celestial kind of structure. And so with the goal here of taking this massive site, because it is huge, one of the largest religious sites in the world, <clears throat> The moat is over two miles in circumference. The height of the central tower is 200 feet. So this idea of really trying to recreate a, a mountain range, you have um, multiple rows kind of, of structures that emanate from the center. You have some nice um, symmetry here again, similar to the Taj Mahal. And so you can just get a sense of the massive quality of this structure and also the idea of how the forest um, it kind of encroaches on the space and we see this a lot with some Cambodian ancient or some important Cambodian sites. There are a lot of relief sculptures decorating Angkor Wat, so there is a goal to try to preserve these. The most famous is called the churning of the sea of milk or the churning of the ocean of milk. So I have an image of churning milk on the side uh, to give you a sense of what we're talking about if you've never churned milk before. Uh, so let's go through what we see here. You have um, Indra at the top and Vishnu at the center with Kerma the, tor the tortoise or the this you can see the shell on the bottom here. And then you have um, Asuras and Devas. So Asuras and Devas, you essentially have these demons and these gods, and they're doing this kind of push and pull of this snake on either side, trying to produce an elixir of immortality. And so this kind of push and pull between good and evil to create this elixir and also to have a moment of creation. And so uh, there have been different interpretations of exactly what we're seeing here. Are, you know, are we seeing Vishnu again in this particular scene? Do we see Brahma, Shiva, or Vishnu? So we're still trying to determine exactly what we're seeing, but it's an incredibly complex scene and it just goes on and on for eternity. I mean, not literally, but you can see how long this relief sculpture is as you go along this particular passageway in Angkor Wat. Uh, it's very low relief, so hard to see some of the details, but they would have been picked out with paint. 
So just showing this scene one more time. There also are apsaras or celestial figures, celestial dancers. Also, these figures all have very unique decoration. They're very curvy, similar to some of the figures we saw in India, but with distinct Cambodian features and decoration, head headwear, kind of the decoration on the head. And some people believe that this is connected back to costume that what you would have seen in the Khmer Empire under individuals like Suryavarman II. Moving into Thailand, just to conclude, um, we see we're going to focus in on the Sukhothai Walking Buddha, which is a very distinct style to India. So in Thailand, the idea of kingship was slightly different than in Cambodia and in the Mughal Empire. So in the Mughal Empire, the, the rulers were very untouchable, the emperors were very untouchable, and somewhat similar in Cambodia. In Thailand, however, the rulers were so much somewhat more earthly and, and connected to the people and walking amongst the people. And so you have this emphasis of um, rulers that are more earthly and also a Buddha that is more earthly and more connected to the people. And also emphasizing this idea of the Buddha as a monk, the Buddha as a teacher, the Buddha who walked amongst people, who traveled in order to spread his Dharma. And so I'm showing you this image of a bronze figure of the Buddha. This is currently in the collection of the British Museum dating to the 14th century. Um, so slightly later than Angkor Wat, but earlier than the, the Mughals. Um, relatively small, 28 centimeters, although we do have much larger representations of this particular type. So it does become this very particular type in Thailand, this type of walking Buddha, this Buddha that walks amongst us, and this Buddha that is more connected to our earthly presence. You can see the distinct kind of flame like Ushnis, Ushnisa, which you see in both of these cases. Um, so you do start to identify some unique features in Southeast Asian Buddhism um, versus what we've seen in India or in East Asia and China, Korea, and Japan. So some heavy ornamentation we saw that as well with the Apsaras at Angkor Wat. Our final key work is the Emerald Buddha, which I think is just a particularly interesting example of a Buddha in Thailand because it really is used to reinforce the power of the king. Uh, the Emerald Buddha is not actually made of an emerald stone. It's probably made of jade, a single piece of jade, 26 inches, so fairly large in size. It, it's dated, according to legend, back to 43 BCE, has this kind of legendary tale of moving from place to place, um, but is recorded in Thailand in the 15th century. That's when it's kind of first documented, recorded presence uh, is from the 15th century. So some interesting things about this, it is kept within this elaborate temple of the Emerald Buddha. It is deeply connected to the king because there is um, an ordination hall that is close by. Also, the king himself comes to change the garments of the Emerald Buddha depending on the season. So this is the Emerald Buddha's winter garb, this is his rainy season garb, and then this is his summer garb. So there's this really interesting interaction between the king and this, the Buddha himself. So the king of Thailand, um, one of the, the last one to die, die, the last one to die, he died in 2016 and he was the longest ruling monarch uh, who was living at the time. And now his son has taken over. So the previous ruler was Rama the Ninth, and now we're on to Rama the Tenth. And so let's look at a few images in addition to this. Um, so it also is supposed to symbolize Mount Meru, similar to the Mount Meru we saw at Angkor Wat, this idea of five tiers, a kind of five tiered um, construction that the Emerald Buddha is placed on top of. And then our final image to see the current king, Rama X, changing the costume from winter to summer. This is an image from 2018. Again, the previous ruler died in 2016. And then you can see um, Buddhist monks coming to pray and meditate in front of the Emerald Buddha and that five-tiered Mount Meru throne. So it's a symbolic structure. There's also jatakas along the sides here, stories of the Buddha's previous lives. It also helps to reinforce the power of the king through the connection to the Buddha. And then in addition to that, some people believe this idea of changing for the seasons is supposed to help with some ideas of controlling the weather. So by preparing the Buddha for the weather, you will then have um, better seasons or the Buddha will help to provide for that. So this idea of the king being particularly strong and important in that sense. All right, our next video will move on to more imperial arts in China and Korea.